First Chronicles, the Old Testament, chapter 28. First Chronicles, chapter 28, verses 9. Here, Solomon, David is, 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 is encouraging his son and, and, and uh, telling him to keep his eye on the Lord because Solomon can build the temple that David had wanted to build. And here, verse 9, David is telling his son, As for you, my son Solomon, know the God of your father, and serve him with a loyal heart and with a willing mind, for the Lord searches all hearts and understands all the intent of the thoughts. How much does God know about us? Everything. All of us. He searches our hearts and understands all the intent, even of our thoughts. Turn me to Jeremiah. I'm going to see here another text. Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah is right after Isaiah. Chapter 17, verses 9 and 10. Here Jeremiah says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The answer is right in the next verse. I, the Lord. Who can know our heart? The Lord. I, the Lord, search the hearts. I test the minds, even to give every man according to his way, according to the fruit of his doing. Who can know the heart and the thoughts? The Lord does. Even though it's deceitful and wicked, here Jeremiah asks, who can know it? And he answers it. The Lord does. The Lord knows it. In Luke 11, just, uh, just one more. There are many scriptures that share with us that God knows every single thing about us. There is nothing. You can hide it from me, you can hide from your spouse, but you can't hide from God. Luke chapter 11, verse 17. <laughs> But he, this is talking about Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house divided against itself, against a house falls. But notice how he begins. He knowing their what? Their thoughts. God knows what you're thinking right now. He knows every single thing about us. And when we think about that, when we think of all that God knows about us, it's kind of dumb to try to be hypocritical. God knows it. You can fool me, you can fool the elders or the deacons, but you can't fool God. If you can't fool God, He knows every single thing about us. And this is why, young people, when you are searching, for your spouse, when you are searching on who to consider marrying, who knows everything about everyone? God. God does. Why not consult with God about the person you're considering? God knows every single thing about that person. And you can talk to God and say, Lord, I'm considering so and so. Is he a good candidate? Does he love you? And the God, God will answer your prayers. God will answer your prayers. If you ever wonder, you know why, you know, ladies, you know, if you ever wonder why, why doesn't, why doesn't he introduce his need to his parents? He doesn't respect them. What does he, what does he ever pay for the meal? It's cheap. <laughs> Yeah. 
if you want to know about somebody, ask the Lord. He knows their thoughts. What, you know, we can find out about their friends and their family, but if you really want to know, ask God, and God will tell you, that's the keeper. That's not a keeper. God will tell you. Now, with this in mind, turn to Job, because the devil knows about us as well. Turn to Job, which is right before Psalms. Job chapter 1. Here, in Job chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And who came among them? Satan. Satan. The day came when all the people came before God and Satan showed up. And the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? From where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. Is Satan familiar with everything that happens here? Absolutely. Absolutely. And then God says, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth? A man blameless and upright man, a man who fears God and shuns evil. No, it's Satan's. So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Did Satan knew that Job feared God? And how much he did and how much he loved him and how much he shunned evil? And he was an upright man. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan knows about us. Satan knows about us. Now, this next verse in Zechariah, Turn with me to Zechariah. Zechariah is the second to the last book in the Old Testament. Zechariah chapter 3. So if we get to the last book, which is Malachi, it's right before that. Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1. Then he showed me Joshua. He's in a vision. He showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord. And guess who's there too? And Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. Don't miss that. Wherever God is and his angels, the demon and the devil are right there too. In case you don't know, the demons are right here, right now. If your phone goes off, the devil, the, you see, the devil does a good job that right when the pastor or the speaker wants to make a point that will penetrate your heart, the devil will cause the baby to cry, cause the phone to ring, or cause your person to nudge you, wants to distract you so you won't get the message. It's not my message. It's the word of God speaking to our hearts. But here he is standing before God and the, of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand. The devil is full of knowledge about you and me. Whenever we go in secret, he's very to it all. We can't hide. But praise the Lord, he's restricted. I want to read with you messages to young people, page 328. Satan cannot read our thoughts. Amen. 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 But, but, he can see our actions, hear our words, and from his long knowledge of the human family, he can shape his temptations to take advantage of our weakness of character. He knows how we grow up, how we grew up, how our parents grew up, how our grandparents grew up. And he, and he sees the line, oh, this family, I can get them with this. Just like God, just like mother, just like father, just like son. And he sees maybe the, the same character being transferred over. He knows all about us, but praise God, he can't read our minds. Praise the Lord, he can't 
Peter. So, if God knows all about us, and the devil knows all about us too, why do we worry what people think about us? You know, I sometimes wonder on why people really get all up tight on what other people think about you. Somebody else cannot take it to them. There's not a person in this world, a person here, that can take you to heaven or that can take you to the fire. You see, we have it backwards. We worry of people, of what they think of us, instead of a God that can read our thoughts and the devil that knows our history, what they think of us. We need to concentrate and focus more on the Lord of the What do you do? God knows you very well, and the devil knows you very well. So then, back to our story in Acts 19, why did the demon say, who are you? He knows us. He knew them. You see, by this time, it was evident that the Holy Spirit was working in the church. Was working in a powerful way. You see, in Acts chapter 2, what happened in Acts chapter 2? The, the, Spirit of the, the Holy Spirit comes down and they begin speaking in tongues, in different languages, in an instant. And thousands are converted. In Acts chapter 3, Peter and John, they heal a lame man. In Acts chapter 4, the church prays and the building shakes. Acts chapter 5, God, the Holy Spirit deals with dishonest couples, a severe punishment. In Acts chapter 6, Stephen preaches and does wonders for God. And yet in Acts chapter 7, while Stephen is being stoned, he sees Jesus through the rocks that are being thrown to him. And he says, forgive them. All of these stories that are happening in Acts get spread like wildfire and rumors around the church. And, and they start talking. Did you hear what Stephen said before he died? Did you hear what Peter and John did? Did you hear what the apostles could speak other languages? In Acts chapter 8, Philip baptizes the Ethiopian eunuch and then it disappeared and transported somewhere else to do the work of God. In Acts chapter 9, Saul is knocked off his horse, made blind, and then his sight is restored again to him. The early church sees the work of the Holy Spirit working and working in, in a powerful, powerful way. In that chapter 10, the Holy Spirit gives Peter a vision. Remember that vision of the sheep of all the animals where, where God says, eat. And the vision was that everyone is equal. You shouldn't call somebody unclean. That the gospel should go to everyone. And, and the gospel begins going to everyone. In Acts chapter 11, more believers are added. In Acts chapter 12, Peter is freed from a prison while he is chained to guards. And he's walked out. The, the angel just says, let's come this way. Walk right out. All of these things are happening in the early church. And word is getting out. Man, God is really working here. Long before chapter 19, the world is getting, the word is getting out of the stuff that is happening in the early church. The power of God. And these sons of Sceva, they want in on that. Yeah, we want to in on some of that talk. It's not, not just Peter and John or Stephen. Don't miss this point, church. The fact that the church is filled with power doesn't mean that you are filled with power. <coughs> The fact that the early church was filled with power and was working didn't mean that these sons of people were filled with power. God works with you and I individually. Individually. The fact that the church is growing doesn't mean that you are growing. Unless you are individually growing in Christ. God deals with us individually and so does the devil deal with you individually. The devil doesn't tempt everyone in the same way. He knows that one temptation may work for Tom, but it may not work for me. Or vice versa. 
So we will be saved or lost depending on what God and Satan know about you. We will be saved or lost depending on what God and Satan know about us. Look at Acts 17, verse 6. You, you see, this, this is how I know that the church was doing powerful things. Acts chapter 17, verse 6. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, These who have what? Turned the world upside down have come here too. Who has turned the world upside down? The Christians, the disciples, the apostles. Miracle after miracle, the work of the Holy Spirit was being poured out. And here they are saying, These who have turned the world upside down are coming here too. And these sons of Sceva wanted in on that power. They wanted in on the action. But who were these sons of Sceva? If you look there in Acts chapter 19, <clears throat> excuse me, Acts 19 verse 13, were they just regular old um, church members? There it says, Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon himself to call the name of the Lord Jesus over whom had evil spirits, saying, We exercise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Also, these were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest. They were sons of a priest. They were pastor's kids. They were PKs. They knew all the doctrine. They grew up in the church. And they thought that just being a son of a priest, pastor's kid, growing up in the church, knowing all the doctrine, that they could rely on that for their spirituality. It doesn't work that way. It does not work that way. I know for a fact that my grandfather, Pedro Raspon, was filled with the Holy Spirit. I can't take it for granted. Well, that means I'm going to be filled too. They depended, they depended on their church time or being related to a priest for their spirituality. But spirituality comes from being filled with the Holy Spirit. But what the worst part is, they were pastor's kids, and what were they involved in? In exorcism. Are you serious? These were boys that knew to stay away from the devil, and yet they were involved in exorcism. They were living for the devil. In Acts, in Acts, of, the, of, Acts of the Apostles 2.87, sorcery had been for prohibited by the Mosaic Law on pain of death. Yet from time to time, it had been secretly practiced by the positive Jews. They wanted what Paul had without living the life of Paul. They wanted what Paul had while they were still playing with the devil. Listen to your pastor, church. If you go out looking for the devil, you will be filled with it. If you will go out looking for the devil, he will possess you. They were exorcists, and it says that they took it upon themselves. We'll do it. Let me go look for a demon somewhere. They're looking for the devil. The problem was, wasn't that they couldn't take out the demon, the problem was that they were already filled with the demon. Anytime you go out looking for Satan, he doesn't need a second behavior. He brings us all through. And Satan is still possessing people today. But he's gotten more subtle. He's gotten more subtle. You see, he enters our thoughts to different ways today. He enters our thoughts 
through games that we play that are all about death and violence. The devil enters our thoughts with that. He enters our thoughts through the movies that we watch of underworld, gothic, dark, vampire things. You see, the devil tries to portray that as a beautiful love story, but it's full of demonic possession. That's what it is. And every time we involve ourselves, the devil sees a door wide open and says, look, there's an open door right there. The devil possesses us by sometimes even watching comedy shows that promote evil things and insult God and make a joke of His principles, of His law, of His people. The devil possesses us by drugs and alcohol that pollute our mind that we cannot reason. He pollutes our minds also when we intake of drinks filled with sugar and caffeine that we cannot reason and hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Don't you guys get quiet so soon? <laughs> Some of us friends are already owned by Him. Some of us are already possessed by the devil and we want to kick him out while we're still feeding him. If these sons of evil were already demon possessed, I have to ask myself, why did the demon say, who are you? The answer is in the word no, K-N-O-W. This is where you do a little more digging into the Bible, where you open up your strong concordance, where you go to, 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 to blueletterbible.com and see what, 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 what these texts mean. You see, when here, the Bible talks about when the demon says, I know who Jesus is. He used a different word for knowing Jesus than knowing Paul. When he says, I know who Jesus is, he's using the Greek word, ginosko. I ginosko, Jesus. But for Paul, he says, I epistomai. It's a different word. Now, ginosko means to know through experience. To know through a personal, personal experience. Do any of you ever have a friend that somebody may come to you with a rumor and say, hey, did you hear so-and-so did this? And you say, uh-uh, I know him or her. They won't do that. That's knowing through experience. Did the demons know Jesus? Yes. How did they know Jesus? They were in heaven. He knew Jesus very well. Jesus kicked them out of heaven. There in Mark 1, 24, where Jesus cast out demons, the demon said, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. What have we to do with you? No, we know who you are. You kicked us out before, Revelation 12. <coughs> We know you very well. We, we have experienced you. Here the demon says, I be no school, Jesus. We've experienced Jesus. We want nothing to do with him. We know what he is capable of doing. Amen. The demons knew Christ through an experience. And that's why the devil wants you not to know Christ as an experience. But when he speaks of Paul, he said, I epistomai, Paul. And epistomai, the word know, is not so much of, and I've experienced him, but more of, I remember him. Oh, I remember him. Sometimes they've asked me, oh, did you know such and such person? I mean, I have known them, but like, I think I remember them in school sometimes. I, re I remember them. And here the demon is saying, I remember Paul. I remember him. We used to own him. But we don't anymore. Oh, Paul, I remember him. Can the devil say that about you? I remember you. You used to walk with us. Oh, I remember you. You used to do what I said. But now you belong to Jesus. Can the devil say, 
I used to know you. Or does he say, I know you? If the sons of Sceva are already demon possessed, then wouldn't the demon say, I don't know you? <laughs> These sons of Sceva were controlled by the demon. Okay? They were out looking. They were out practicing exorcism. Looking for the devil. When you go out searching for the devil, you become devil possessed. So the demon already possessed them. The demons knew them as their servants. As their what? As their servants. Don't miss that. Are you catching it? The demons knew them as their servants. And here, the servant is telling the boss to get out. These servants are telling their boss, the demon, get it. And the demon says, excuse me, I know who Jesus is. I still believe in him. I remember Paul. He used to own him. But who are you telling us to get out? You're not the boss. We are the boss. And what the demons do? Beat them, drip them, get out of here. You don't tell us what to do. We'll tell you what to do. Take off your clothes and beat it. The demons told these seven sons of people, we own you yesterday, we own you today. Get out of here. When is a day going to come, church? When is a day going to come when the devil has no longer any control over you? You see, we can't just play and play and play and play and play with the devil and his toys and expect that in the time of show we're going to stand for God. He went to the club the night and drinking. 
He got drunk many times. He played with the devil. Played in his territory. And was thinking, that's fine. God is still with me. Judges chapter 16, verse 20. And she said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as before at other times. What did he say? I will go out at when? Just like I've always done. I can play with the devil and God is still with me. And shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. subject this morning is what about you? What about you? We cannot play with the devil, friends, and expect that God can still have our backs. And expect that the time of trouble we're going to stand for him and right now we don't surrender everything to him and be his servants and not Satan servants. When is the day going to come when the devil will say, I used to know you, you used to walk with me. We used to go out Saturday night, you remember where? We used to go to your favorite websites. Want to go back? When is that time going to come when the devil will no longer say that? I hope and pray that's today. Here, Samson, as we know the story, played and played and played. You've heard the same curiosity what? Kill the cat. Listen, young people. Curiosity with the world can kill your soul. Amen. And kill your eternal life.
We don't want to be possessed by them. So I just ask that you help us every day to surrender our hearts, our lives, our habits, our stuff that invites the devil. Help us to spend more time in your word in preparation for that time of trouble. So that when it does come and we do stand, the devil will say, Yes, you know you. Now you can stand because you are with Christ. Father in heaven, be with your church here in Cleburne and with your church all around the world. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Amen. But you open your hymns and stand at the